Hello everyone, this is Cypherdeck. Also, my uh, my real name is Michael Lowe. I wanted to talk about myself today a little bit, and then we're going to read some Tony Tuckatani. Because, um... So, since I was about 12 years old, I believe that's whenever it happened. I, I, I believe, actually it was earlier whenever I actually started wearing glasses, but whenever I was 12... I had uh, this issue, and I've always had this issue where whenever I read, all the words blur together. It's it's like I can read a paragraph, I can have said all the words in my mind, and I don't get, I don't get the story or what's going on. It doesn't pull me into the story because of the fact that I can't perceive what it is that's being said. So I uh, I stopped I stopped reading uh, for wow uh, thirty plus years I mean I read manuals I know how to build build things from manuals but those are like short little quips I I do read uh, comic books but uh, those are also you can go a few pages sometimes without any words being said but uh, yeah. It's it's weird that I've gone that long without reading. And it's it's something that I've always wanted to do. I always loved reading whenever I was a kid. So let's talk about my eyes. This is the whole reason why reading, I think, um, failed, was failed for me. Whenever I was a kid, I didn't wear glasses. And then I wore glasses. I don't remember when it was, but it was before I was 12 years old. And I noticed that I was having problems reading. Um, so we ended up going to a specialist that gave me these glasses that had like a light blue tint to them. And it made everything that I read, every page that I read, this blue tint. And um, before, before I got the glasses, I got this... These, um, do you remember in school whenever you had those, um, I guess it's lamellar or it's these clear sheets of colored plastic and, uh, you would put it over something and it would either be a bookmark or a placeholder or whatever it was, but that's the kind of thing I would have to put over anything that I was reading for school. So, um, we saw the specialist, and I got the glasses, and it worked fine for a little bit, and then I noticed that, um, not until probably I was 20, not until 20 or, or even older, no, it was probably 25, I noticed that my right eye would, would not be, um, was not being my dominant eye anymore, it was, it was actually not even using the lens, and I thought it was maybe because the lens was bad. I went to a specialist again, and they said that they'd have to use a prism, so they rescheduled me, and I went back in, and they had every prism that was available to them. I mean, they had these ma these these prisms that would make my glasses thicker than anything you guys probably have ever seen on TV or live. It's like Mr. Burns kind of thick prism glasses. <laughs> But every prism they use would not bring my eye back to center. Now, it's not saying that my eye won't normally, if I push my eyes to work together, they won't work together. The problem is, is that whenever I do that, I get these blotchy black and white flashing thing that happens to my eyes. And I think it's because of the fact that while my right lens works perfectly for my right eye and my left lens works perfectly for my left eye, what I need, and this isn't something that eye doctors do, is that I need glasses that are made for both eyes whenever they're both looking straight to become in sync. I mean, they, I need a one set of glasses that actually makes both eyes work together. Now, I was told I could get surgery. Uh, that's not what I want, because what if the surgery makes it so that I always have these black and white blotches whenever I'm looking forward? So, 
recently, uh, for the last month, every day, I sit and I look straight with uh, forcing my eyes straight, and it's become easier. But um, I still have no depth of field. I, I still have no uh, ability to, if I was playing football or basketball, that if someone threw the ball towards my direction, that I'd be able to catch it because I am still flailing, trying to actually um, anticipate or um, even judge how far the ball is away from me. Because for the last 30 plus years, my eye, my left eye has been my dominant eye. It's actually what allows me to zoom in. Where both eyes, when they're working together, should give you a depth of field where whenever I touch my monitors, like I am now, I can see that I'm touching my monitors. Or whenever something is traveling at me, I should be able to see the, the distance before it gets to me. But with both eyes working in, in junction or in, uh, together, they don't do that. So I was like, I, I was getting frustrated with reading and I saw a video and I don't care how you feel about the guy or anything else about it, but PewDiePie, this sarcastic comedian-esque meme filled guy's channel did a, he read books, he read five books and he did real overviews on those books what what he liked about them the story itself and things like that and that was that got me in the mindset that hmm maybe i should be reading again so he gave out four books that he wants us uh wants people to read and then come back and talk to him about it in his comments i don't know if i'm doing it for that i'm not doing it for that i'm doing it for myself but um, I took all the book names and I, I wrote them down and found out that this one, Tony Takatani, was a short story that was posted in the New Yorker. So it was something that I didn't have to go to the library and and uh, check out or anything like that. And it was a short story. It's like 20 pages or something like that. And I wanted to go ahead and read it. So then came the dilemma where I was having problems where whenever I was reading it, I wasn't grasping the words that were, were being told to me. I was, there's like rich information that's being told in this, but I'm not getting it. So I sat down with, uh, with the other, one of the other books that's on the list, which is Moby Dick. And for the first time, I just sat there and instead of trying to read it, um, in my mind, I started saying it out loud and I could understand everything. I could feel, uh, Ishmael's actual understanding of the ocean, how it draws humans to water and that why are all of these thousands of men and women here if not to want to be in the footsteps of someone, uh, who is, who is out to sea. But they, they're too scared. They're too scared to leave their peers. And it's, it's, really, it's a really cool overview. And I, the one thing that he mentions, and this is something that's dear to me because I am a huge fan of mythology. And he says, why do you think um, the Romans gave the sea its own god? Uh, something along, along those lines. And I was like, wow, that, that makes me feel about what he's talking about that that draw or that pull to something that you really enjoy and how you can see that other people's would enjoy other people not people's other people would enjoy it if they only didn't have the fear of it and he says something along the lines of that he's not a passenger because he doesn't have um he doesn't have a coin purse that has money in it and what is a coin purse but a piece of fabric without without money and that he is his own sailor, but he's not a cat. Anyway, that's a whole other story. So I thought that why don't I make it myself accountable for reading the story? And because of the fact I have to read it out loud anyway to grasp it. And that, that's what I'm finding is that I read the first line and I started wanting to read the rest of it. And that's kind of what really makes me want to read these kind of things. So, firstly, 
I'm going to say that I am really bad at names, especially ones that are um, in the story. Like, there's one that's Shazaburo. I don't know if that's how you, how you would pronounce it, uh, but it is Tony Takatani by Haruki Murakami, I believe is how you would say his name. And I, I do apologize to him if I said it incorrectly. So let us begin. Actually, I'm going to grab a drink real quick. Okay, okay, I'm good to go. Let's do this. Tony Takatani's real name was really that, Tony Takatani. Because of his name and his curly hair and his deeply sculpted features, he was often assumed to be a mixed blood child. This is just after the war when there were lots of children around whose blood was half American GI, but Tony Takatani's mother and father were both 100% genuine Japanese. His father, Shazaburo Takatani, had been a fairly successful jazz trombonist, but four years before the Second War broke out, he was forced to leave Tokyo because of a problem involving a woman. If he had to leave town, he figured he might as well really leave, so he crossed over to China with nothing but his trombone in hand. In those days, Shanghai was just a day boat ride from Nakasaki. Shazaburo, I, I hope I'm saying that right, owned nothing in Tokyo or anywhere else in Japan that he would hate to lose. He left without regrets. If anything, he, he suspected Shanghai with its well-crafted and enticements would be better suited to his personality than Tokyo was. He was standing on the deck of a boat, plowing its way to the Yangtze River the first time he saw Shanghai's elegant avenues glowing in the morning sun, and that, uh, and that did it. Did I miss a line there? Pulling through the waters? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, sorry about that. Um, the light seemed to promise him a future of tremendous brightness. He was 21 years old. And so he took it easy through the upheaval of the war, from Japanese invasions of China to the attack on Pearl Harbor to the dropping of two atomic bombs he played his trombone in Shanghai's night of oh, Shanghai nightclubs, as a as the struggles took place somewhere far away. Shoshiburo Takatani was a man who possessed not the slight inclin inclination to influence, or even reflect upon, uh, or even to reflect upon history. He wanted nothing more than to be able to play his trombone, eat three meals a day, and have a few women nearby. He was sim simultaneously modest and arrogant, deeply self-centered, and nevertheless treated those around him with kindness and good feeling, which is why most people liked him. Young, handsome, and talented musician, he stood out wherever he went, like a crow on a sun uh, on a snowy day. He slept with more women than he could count: Japanese, Chinese, White Russian, whores, married women, gorgeous girls, and girls who were not so go <laughs> so go so gorgeous. He did it with anyone he could get his hands on. Before long, a, his super sweet trombone and his super active giant penis had made him a Shanghai sensation. Shizaburo was also blessed, though he did not realize it. With a talent for making useful friends, he was on a good uh, he was on good terms with high-ranking army officials millionaires and various influential types of uh, types who were reaping 
gigantic profits from the war through obscure channels. A lot of them carried pistols under their jackets and never excited, uh, ex, ex, exited a building without giving the street a quick scan right or left for some reason Shazaburo, Takatani, and they just clicked, and they took special care of him whenever problems came up. But talent can sometimes work against you. When the war ended, Shozaburo, Shozaburo's connections won him the attention of the Chinese army, and he was locked up for a long time. Day after day, others who had been imprisoned for similar reasons were taken out of their cells and executed without trial. Guards would just appear, drag them into the prison yard, and blow their brains out with automatic pistols. Shoshaburo assumed that he would be he would die in prison, but the prospect of death did not frighten him greatly. Greatly? Okay, greatly, greatly, greatly. They would put a bullet through him, uh, through his brain, and it would be all over. A split second of pain. I've lived way, uh, I lived the way I wanted all these years, he thought. I've slept with tons of women. I've eaten a lot of good food and had a lot of good times. There isn't so much in life that I am sorry I missed. Besides, I'm not in any position to complain about being killed. It's a weird way to think about it. It's just the way it goes. Hundreds of hundreds, hundreds of thousands of Japanese have died in this war, and many of them in far more terrible ways. As he waited, Shozaburo... Watch the clouds drift by the bars of his tiny window and painted mental pictures of his cell's filthy walls of the faces and bodies of the women he had slept with. In the end, though, he turned out to be one of the only two Japanese prisoners to leave the prison alive and go home to Japan. By that time, the other men... Uh, a high-ranking officer had nearly lost his mind. Shizuburo stood on the deck of the boat, and and as he watched the avenues of Shanghai sh shrinking away in the distance, he thought, "Life, I'll never understand it." Im okay. Emas uh, okay, em emaciated emaciated with no positions to speak with, um, which means he was very, very thin, if I remember correctly. With no positions to speak of, Shuzubu Tukatani came back to Japan in the spring of 1946. Nine months after the war had ended, he discovered that his parents' house had burned down in the Great Tokyo, uh, Tokyo Air Raid on March 1945. And they were dead. His only brother had disappeared without a trace on the Burmese front. In other words, Shozubo, so, so I'm going to just start naming, uh, saying Shoza, Shoza <laughs> was now alone in the world. This was not a great shock to him. However, nor did it make him feel particularly sad. He did, of course, experience some sense of absence. But he was convinced that everyone ended up alone sooner or later. He was in his 30s and beyond the age of complaining about loneliness. He felt as if he had suddenly aged several years at once. But that was all. Not further emotion, uh, no further emotion welled up inside of him. One way or another, Shozaburo had managed to survive, and he was he would have to start thinking of ways to go on living. 
Because he knew only the line, uh, only one line of work, he hunted up some of his old buddies and put together a little jazz band that started playing at the American military base. His talents, uh, his talent for making contacts, won him the friendship of a jazz-loving American army major, an Italian-American from New Jersey, who played a mean clarinet himself. The two of them often jammed together in their spare time. An officer in the quartermaster corps, the major, um, the major could get all the records he wanted straight from the United States, and Shosaburo would go to the major's quarters and listen to the happy jazz of Bobby Hackett, Jack, oh my God, T. Garden, and Benny Goodman, teaching himself as many of their licks as he could. The major supplied him with all kinds of food and milk and liquor, which were definite uh, were difficult to get him uh, get a hold of in those days. Not bad, shows uh, shows thought. Not a bad time to be alive. I think I'm gonna go ahead and end it there. I think it's um I think it's a pretty interesting mindset to to be in that in that way where you feel that you you've had a a, a full life. And that it doesn't phase you. I mean, I mean, you know, you at you as a person, maybe internalizing the the thoughts or pain or anything like that. But there's a stalwartness about them, and I think that's that's pretty cool. If you want to watch more, let me know. Uh, but I'm gonna continue reading either way. I I need to, and I I feel I'm understanding everything that I'm saying. So. Uh, while I'm not a great reader, I'm not good at reading some some names. Sometimes I have to figure out what what the word is by just stopping for a second. Um, it is making me read, and that is what I really like about it. So let me know what you think, guys. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Michael Lowe, aka Cipher Deck, and I'll see you next time.